here. Uh, I know it's very important, but you know, you need some time to think about it. Uh, we're very, very happy to have uh, Tracy Smith here from MIT. Uh, Trace um, history. Tracy did her uh, um, graduate work at Harvard with um, uh, Doug Finkbeiner. Um, after that, she was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. Then she moved to MIT, where she's been. For long enough to get tenure, mm -hmm. however long that is, I forget how long that, that, that clock is, but that's how long she's been there. Um, her background is um, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, uh, Doug Finkbeiner is um, an astrophysicist, an astrophysicist, astrophysicist, really. Uh, but somehow, uh, uh, while she was there, uh, I was fortunate enough to overlap with her while she was a graduate student. I had an opportunity to, to work with her. Uh, and so she ended up with this very sort of hybrid background of knowing where she can hang out with particle physicists, and we think she's a particle physicist, and she can hang out with astrophysicists, and they'll treat her as an astrophysicist, and so she actually has the ability to um, uh, talk to both communities, and that's made her incredibly influential in thinking about uh, astrophysical signals of dark matter. Um, she's um, won uh, numerous prizes, the Primakov uh, Award for um, Early Career Scientists, uh, the PK's Award, which is sort of the fanciest uh, early career award from the DOE, and she also won the Rossi Prize, which is not an early career award, but for her actual discovery, uh, along with uh, Meng Su and uh, Doug Pinkfeiner, of these enormous uh, gamma ray uh, features in the center of the Milky Way, which are now referred to as the Fermi, Fermi bubbles, which were very controversial for a while, uh, but are no longer, I don't think. Um, uh, she's also one of, uh, uh, she's one of the leading thinkers about how to use the cosmic microwave background to place limits on dark matter, especially a lot of the new models of dark matter people have been excited about. And she's also one of the uh, um, foremost thinkers about a very, very exciting thing related to dark matter that I'm not going to tell you about because she's going to tell you about it. So anyway, please, Tracy, take it away, please. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and for the wonderful introduction, Neil. Yeah, what Neil said, Neil was sort of effectively my co-advisor during my PhD, so I spent a fair bit of time at NYU, but apparently this is the first time I have given a formal talk here, uh, much to my surprise, so I'm very happy to uh, be doing this eventually. So yeah, as Neil said, I want to tell you about the ongoing saga of a particular gamma ray signal coming from the region around the center of our galaxy, which is indicated in this little inset plot, which is known generally as the Galactic Center Excess, or GCE. So I want to begin by just giving some background information that is uh, helpful for understanding what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk. I want to talk about what we expect to be the sources of gamma rays, the highest energy form of light coming from our Milky Way galaxy, and explain why uh, people are interested in looking in gamma rays for possible signatures of dark matter particles annihilating and producing visible photons. Then, once we've gotten through that background, I want to move on and talk about the galactic center excess itself. I want to talk about you know, a little bit about how it was discovered, about what properties it has, and why it's been of such interest to both the particle physics communities and the astrophysics communities, because it has possible interpretations, both as a possible signal of annihilating dark matter, and as evidence of a new and hitherto unknown new population of gamma ray emitting pulsars. And then I want to say you know, how, we've, how we've tried to distinguish between these interpretations, I want to talk about methods that we developed based on work by people here at NYU to search for pulsars in this data set, which for several years led to a broad consensus that this excess had to be from pulsars. And then I want to give you the latest update from the last year or so, which has started to challenge that consensus. So this talk is not going to present firm conclusions about where this excess is coming from. <coughs> I'm going to tell you a story, and to spoil you, like at the end, the conclusion is going to be that we, th there are still a lot of open possibilities for what this could be, but I hope to tell you something interesting along the way. Okay, I'll also mention that uh, tomorrow, the, tomorrow's seminar by Dr. Sam McDermott is also going to be about this excess. I think I have one slide about Sam's results, which are super interesting and are in this last section, uh, but since it's my second last slide, I may end up going through it quite quickly, depending on timing. So if you're interested in this, I also recommend uh, attending Sam's seminar tomorrow. Okay. So let's talk about the background first off. So I'm going to be talking about a possible dark matter signal in high energy gamma rays. So what are the known sources of gamma rays in the Milky Way? So the dominant source of gamma rays in the Milky Way comes from charged particles called cosmic rays striking the interstellar gas. So this is a cartoon made by NASA, if a cosmic ray proton comes in and hits a hydrogen atom, 
that can produce um, that produces a shower of particles, including neutral pions. Neutral pions decay to gamma rays with about a 99% branching ratio. So this is where most of the gamma rays in the Milky Way come from. So they come from uh, the sea of charged protons pervading our galaxy, interacting with the interstellar gas. For this reason, we expect the gamma rays from this mechanism to look more or less like the distribution of gas in the sky, because the distribution of protons is, roughly speaking, uh, expected to be fairly constant throughout the Milky Way because our protons diffuse with a really long path length, but they lose all their energy. So this is a map of the interstellar dust <laughs> in the Milky Way. So this is a two-dimensional projection along the line of sight. So of course the sky is actually a sphere, it has been projected out onto this rectangle. The plane of the Milky Way is along the horizontal axis in this image. It's this bright region along here is the disk of the Milky Way spiral galaxy in which we are embedded and the center of the galaxy is at the center of this image. So most of the dust, so the dust and gas in the galaxy is most dense along the disk of the spiral galaxy. So this is in the same place if you've ever looked up at the night sky, especially from the southern hemisphere and seen the band of stars that is the Milky Way. This is the same band, only in gas and dust instead of in starlight. Um, but as you see, there's, still, there's quite a lot of gas and dust in regions away from the plane as well. So at zero order, this is what we expect to see when we looked at the gamma ray sky, is basically the same gas and dust distribution lighting up in gamma rays. Now there are other sources of gamma rays as well. We have, as well as high energy protons uh, <coughs> pervading our galaxy, we also have a sea of high energy electrons. Those high energy electrons can scatter off the gas, as I just discussed, or they can strike uh, ambient photons like starlight photons and upscatter them to very high energies. So this Second process is called inverse Compton scattering. It's just electron photon scattering. It's usually abbreviated ICS. Uh, electron scatter around the gas through Bramstrahlen is often abbreviated as Bram. So when we build a model for the gamma rays that we expect to see from our galaxy, we'll include um, gas correlated emission from protons and electrons scattering with the gas, as well as an ICS emission component that comes from electrons interacting with photons. Now, this is going to be important later on. For all of these processes, we understand the basic physics of what's going on reasonably well, but that doesn't make that we can mean that we can make a perfectly accurate prediction for what the signals should look like in the sky, because that would require a knowledge of the three-dimensional distribution of gas and cosmic rays and starlight throughout our galaxy, and we don't have that. So all the background models that I show you are going to be estimates, they're going to be approximations, they qualitatively describe the data very well. Once you get down to the quantitative level, it's possible to have errors in the map that can have implications for the conclusions that you draw. Okay. Now, as well as these sources of emission from cosmic rays interacting with the gas, we can also have point sources of gamma rays. Gamma ray pulsars, which will be a big uh, topic later in this colloquium, uh, are rapidly spinning neutron stars that can emit radiation at a wide range of frequencies. Supernovae are uh, um, exploding stars can also produce gamma rays in the frequency band that we'll be looking at. In other galaxies, active galactic nuclei, um, so, uh, so you know, jets from giant black holes, some of the brightest objects in the universe, they can shine brightly in gamma rays as well. So all of these objects can look, so these um, objects can look like point sources of gamma rays where we can't distinguish their extension on the sky, they just look like bright spots in the sky. And for those of us who are interested in searches for exotic physics using astrophysical signals, there's also the possibility that dark matter particles, and I'll say more about this in a moment, could be colliding with each other or decaying away and producing high energy particles, which would be a signal for which we can look against the background of all these other objects. <coughs> so let's, um, so before I go on to dark matter, let me just um, show you what we expect the first, the conventional kind of gamma ray astrophysics look like. So this is an example of a model for the diffuse gamma rays we expect to see from our galaxy. We've constructed it from maps of the gas, maps of the starlight, and uh, estimates of where the cosmic ray populations are in our galaxy. So black means more gamma rays, and again, this is the plane of the Milky Way. In all of these models, you'll see the plane of the Milky Way lighting up brightly, because that's where all the gas is, that's where all the stars are. Um, we can change the saturation scale. You see the innermost region of the plane is really the, is really the brightest. And then there are these uh, extended regions of high emission above and below the plane. This is in one particular energy band. If we were to look at how bright this signal is 
as a function of energy. This is an estimate for the emission from protons hitting protons, from, um, from electron scattering on starlight, and from electron scattering on the gas. And what I want you to really note just from this is that if we plot how much power there is in these channels as a function of energy, then if energy is above about 1 GB, uh, the expected spectrum is basically a power law. It's just smooth, it's featureless, it falls off at high energies. Okay. So this is the background. So this is the background. The sky is the background against which we are going to look for interesting signals of stuff that we do not yet understand. Okay. So what kinds of things, so, okay, so I guess I will pause and just ask if there are any immediate questions at this point, and then I'll tell you what kind of signals we can look for against this background. Okay, we good? I haven't lost everyone so far here. Okay. So, as Neil told you, I spend a lot of my time thinking about the puzzle of dark matter. This is a big puzzle. Many people have spent many decades thinking about it. Um, so I want to persuade you here that looking for signals of dark matter in gamma rays is a reasonable thing to do. So let me give you the sort of one slide summary of what we think we know about dark matter at present. So we believe we know that dark matter is dark in that it doesn't scatter, emit, or absorb light at a significant <coughs> level, so you could really call it transparent matter, but it does have mass and hence gravity. So the first part of this is dark and the second part is matter. We believe that it's about 84% of all the matter in the universe by mass. That number is measured from the cosmic microwave background, sometimes called the Big Bang afterglow radiation. The pattern of oscillations in the CMB gives us information on how much matter was interacting with radiation when the universe was about 300,000 years old. We get this number that had to be about 84%. We believe that this dark matter forms the primordial scaffolding for the visible universe. So these, these plots are from the uh, simulation of structure formation by the, my colleagues in the Illustris collaboration at MIT. So from these lowest panels, this is starting at early times. As you go up in the panels, it's moving toward, towards later times. The left panel is showing what the dark matter is doing. You see it's forming this filamentary cosmic web structure. And there are nodes of high density along this cosmic web. In the meantime, the visible matter, which is a subdominant component of all the matter in the universe, is gravitationally attracted to these regions of high matter density. Uh, once the visible matter has been attracted into those regions, the gas can collapse, it can form stars, it can form galaxies. And these structure formations fairly accurately predict the observed universe, at least on large scales. So in this sense, we believe that the dark matter forms the cosmological scaffolding for the galaxies and visible matter that we see today. Related to that, from the picture that I just told you, we expect that galaxies form in regions of high dark matter density. So we, uh, this was actually one of our first pieces of observational evidence for dark matter, is that observationally, at least most of the galaxies that we see, appear to be surrounded by large clouds of dark matter, which in the previous picture are just the clouds of dark matter in which they were born. So we can measure the presence of these large clouds of dark matter around galaxies from looking at the orbital velocities of stars and gas clouds and how those orbital velocities change as we move out from the galactic center. So these are all positive statements about the properties of dark matter. How much of it there is, what it does, where it's located. But this last point is a negative statement, which is that as far as we can tell, dark matter interacts with other particles except through gravity, either rather weakly or perhaps even not at all. So this is an upper limit. It comes from the null results of existing searches for interactions between dark and visible matter. Although we are still hopeful that the answer may be weakly rather than not at all, and there may be an interesting signal to find here. But just this information is already enough to uh, tell us that dark matter can't really be easily be explained by any of the particles that we know about in the standard model. Neutrinos are the closest candidate, as they are uncharged, they're dark in that sense, they have mass, they gravitate, but it turns out that neutrinos are too fast moving to form that cosmic scaffolding, which is the essential underpinning of structure formation in our universe. So we believe that dark matter can't be explained by any known particles. That is the puzzle. This, of course, leaves many questions open, with the big one being, what is this stuff? The first place, but we can subdivide that. We can ask, what is the dark matter made from? Are we talking about one new particle? Are we talking about many new particles? Are we talking about tiny black holes left over from the very early universe? 
Where did it come from? Why does it have this abundance of 84% of the matter in the universe? Where, where is that number from? Does it actually interact with ordinary particles? If so, how does it interact with those particles? And I could keep asking questions like this for a long time. So in this talk, I want to discuss first so one sort of general strategy for trying to figure out the answers to some of these questions and then tell you about the signal and why people think it might potentially have information about some of these questions. So a, po a possible answer to one of these questions, which is how do we get, why do we get the abundance of dark matter that we do, why is it 84% of the matter in the universe, comes from scenarios where we say, well, early in the universe there was much more dark matter than there is today. It was produced um, in the same abundance as radiation through its interactions with the standard model, but then as the temperature of the universe dropped below the mass of the dark matter, most of, the da most of that early abundance was depleted by some annihilation process. So by annihilation here, I mean that when two dark matter particles collide with each other, some new physics could happen, this is the a miracle occurs step, and this, and this in collision could produce new visible particles, which could be quarks or leptons or gauge bosons or anything else in the standard model, which would subsequently decay according to the standard model particle processes that we understand, <coughs> making stable standard model particles. So photons, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, and neutri neutrinos and antineutrinos. So, um, in this, in these kinds of, this process could occur in many scenarios, but in the set of scenarios where it sets the relic abundance, then the rate of annihilation of dark matter in the early universe determines how much of it is left today. We can measure how much dark matter is left today and use that to infer an annihilation cross-section in the context of these models um, for, for the dark matter. And we get this number, which is parametrically just one over the Planck mass times the temperature of matter radiation equality, which corresponds to a section of about 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. This number will only be important later in this talk in the context that I will show you, um, uh, I will show you cross sections and say they are similar to this number. So you don't need to remember the details, but just remember that there is in these scenarios a predictive um, picture for what the annihilation rate of dark matter should be. Now, there are many variations on this scenario. This is not a guaranteed scenario. Um, Josh Ruderman has worked on many of those variations, so you should talk to him if you have other ideas. But this has for a long time motivated searches for dark matter in a particular mass range and with this kind of annihilation cross-section. So in particular, this kind of annihilation cross-section is pretty close to a weak scale annihilation cross-section. I've written it here as 1 over 100 TeV squared, but I could also write it as a small coupling, like the fine structure constant alpha squared divided by 1 TeV squared. So this is the kind of cross-section that I would expect for something that interacts somewhat like a neutrino. And if that's true, then that suggests a natural possible mass scale for this new particle somewhere around the weak scale. So somewhere around the scale of the W and Z and Higgs bosons. Now, again, this is not a guarantee. There are many models of dark matter which do not have this property. But if we had dark matter around the weak scale, we could fairly naturally get the right abundance of dark matter. And if that, those dark matter particles were to annihilate because their mass scale was about 100 GeV, we would expect them to produce gamma rays, other standard model particles, in the energy range of around a GeV to 100 GeV, i.e. in the gamma ray band. So this has motivated a lot of people to say, okay, let's take those gamma ray maps that we were looking at earlier and see if we can see any signals of dark matter annihilation in them. So what would a dark matter signal look like in this case? There are basically two um, types of observable that we have here. We can look at the spatial distribution of the signal, and we can look at the energy distribution of the signal. And we looked at this already for the backgrounds. So the spatial distribution of the signal for dark matter should basically look like the dark matter halo, which as I said is the large fuzzy halo surrounding our galaxy. It should be the density of that halo squared will give you the dark matter signal rate. In terms of how bright the signal is as a function of energy, we typically expect it to have some, um, some preferred scale, some bump at a particular energy, which is set by, which is determined by the mass of the dark matter particles and what they annihilate to. So this is an example for 30 GeV dark matter annihilating into a range of different possible standard model final states. If I plot the power per logarithmic interval in photons expected from this annihilation, then I see for the different standard model annihilation states a range of bumps in different locations. But it's always true that there's some characteristic scale, some bump structure. 
So if I want to um, look at how the signal, how a dark matter signal would compare to the diffuse background, so this, these are the spatial picture. So this is the spatial picture of the estimated signal that I told you about earlier, just based on the gas in the galaxy. It's brightest along the galactic plane, but the signal from a dark matter halo should be more spherical because the halo itself is more spherical. If we look at the energy information above a GeV, the backgrounds are mostly smooth, falling like power laws, but the signal can have a characteristic scale, with that scale being set by the dark matter mass. Now, if we ask where should we look for this, well, we expect dark matter to accumulate towards the center of the galaxy, where the gravitational potential well is deepest. So the galactic center generally has the brightest predicted signal. But at the same time, since the galactic center is like here on this plot, the backgrounds are also quite challenging there. That's so the backgrounds are hard in the galactic center, but just in terms of statistics, it may be the best place to look. Okay, and the way that I'm going, this is a little bit technical, but the way that I'm going to model the dark matter density in the rest of this talk is as a is this uh, generalized Navarro Frank White profile. So this is just a density that goes roughly <laughs> like one over r towards the center of the galaxy, or one over r to some power. So it's just a r to the minus gamma power law towards the center of the galaxy, and which then steepens to an r to the minus three power law further out. And this is just based on simulations. Okay, so that's okay. So I've told you what we expect to see from the background. And if we were looking for a dark matter signal, what we might hope to see in gamma rays. So now let me show you what the data actually says and come to the point of um, come to the point of the talk. Okay. So this is data observed by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which was launched in 2008 and has thus been up in the sky for uh, 11, about I guess 11 and a half years now. So. This is the data as taken from Fermi fairly early in its mission. I think this is actually data from 2010 in the energy range between two and five GeV. So again, this is a map of the whole sky. We've taken the spherical sky and spread it out, projected it onto this rectangle. And as expected, we see a lot of bright emission along the plane of the galaxy. And there are also some, but there are also some other things in this data uh, I should also say that this data, there are some bright point sources in this data originally, but the brightest ones have all been removed from this data set before I showed you this image. So the simplest thing we can do is just take this data and subtract off a background model like the ones we built before for the gamma rays coming from charged particles interacting with the gas. When we do that, what happens is something like this. So my colleagues and I first did this, and including Neil, first did this analysis back in late 2008 Fairly, uh, sorry, late 2009, fairly soon after Fermi data became public. And when we first did this, the first thing that immediately jumped out at us was that there's a kind of figure eight shaped structure centered on the, um, centered on the galactic center. This is, not the main, this is not the main focus of the talk, but I'll just mention it briefly. So these are the structures that Neil mentioned in his introduction called the Fermi bubbles. This is a colorized version of the previous map to make them stand out a bit more. So these, it, the Fermi bubbles are a giant double lobed structure centered on the galactic center. As you can see from this image, they're really like huge galaxy scale objects. They extend about 50 degrees to the north and south of the galactic center. So if they're really at the galactic center, that means that they're about um, 25,000 light years tall. Each lobe is about 25,000 light years tall. They're bright in gamma rays between about 1 and 100 GeV. We've seen counterparts in X-ray and microwave. It's still not entirely clear what these are, but it looks like there is some kind of fast outflow from the base, from the galactic center that's uh, expanding into these bubbles. That could be a relic of activity of the black hole at the galactic center a few million years ago. The outflow could also potentially be fueled by um, a lot of supernovae going off in the region around the galactic center. Uh, the bubbles have many puzzling features. The origin is still, to my knowledge, a fairly open question. I'm happy to say more about them if people are interested. But this is not a, this is a puzzle in gamma rays, but it is not the puzzle in gamma rays that I want to tell you about. So at around the same time that my colleagues and I were discovering the Fermi bubbles, Lisa Goodenough, when she was an NYU grad student, and Dan Hooper were looking at a more difficult uh, were looking at what might be a better dark matter search region, which is the region right in around the galactic center. And what they found when they did this was that there was an apparent excess of gamma rays over what you would have expected just from the diffuse backgrounds that we've already talked about. So this is from a paper by a paper a few years later by Abizajian and Kaplinghat in 2012 showing you, again, we can look at spatial distribution and energy distribution 
Um, so this is the region within just like um, a seven degree by seven degree square around the galactic center. This is all the emission, including the diffuse emission from cosmic rays interacting with the gas. And this blob on the right is what's left once you subtract off a model for that emission from cosmic rays interacting with the gas and starlight. The color bar scales are different by a factor of three between the left and the right panel. So this is not actually like 100% of the signal in the center of the galaxy. It's more like a third. So this blob of gamma ray emission is the excess that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. It was discovered by Lisa Goodenough and Dan Hooper in 2009. I got involved in study of this excess a few years later when Dan Hooper and I found that actually, while in this image, it looks like it's really restricted to the region within about a degree of the galactic center. Um, that's actually an artifact of the analysis. And you can show at high confidence that this excess fills the whole region within about 5,000 light years of the galactic center. Um, so we, we actually found this while attempting to study the base of the Fermi bubbles. And we found that the Fermi bubbles were mysteriously full of an excess that looked just like this. So the energy spectrum of the excess is its brightest at an energy of about 1 to 3 GeV. This, is from a 20, this spectrum is taken from a 2013 analysis. The um, black and red points are the um, best values of the excess with, statistical and systematic, with estimates of the statistical and systematic error bars. And the reason why the dark matter community got very excited about this is that the blue line here is the signal that you would expect from a dark matter model. It's one of those bump-like spectra that I showed you earlier. <coughs> the, the work on this was initially done by theorists outside the Fermi collaboration, of which I am one, but the Fermi experimental collaboration confirmed it in an analysis in 2016. Okay, so what more can we say about the problem? So this excess, like the bubbles, was also extremely controversial for the first several years of its existence, but I think there is now a pretty general consensus that this signal exists. The question of what it is, though, is far more unsettled. So we can say a little bit more about the properties of this excess. So my collaborators and I found that the peak, so the, the spectrum looks like a bump. The peak of the bump is at about one to three giga electron volts. So, you can, uh, so um, the excess looks approximately spherically symmetric around the galactic center. Uh, there was this nice analysis by Caloric, Hollis, and Weniger in 2014 where they broke up the excess into different subregions, and they asked how, what the emission looked like in each of these different subregions. <coughs> and the resulting spectra are shown on the right. And you can see that they found this bump of 1 to 3 GeV pretty. So this is, again, power per logarithmic interval. Black points are statistical error bars. Yellow bands are systematic uncertainty estimates. <coughs> and they pretty consistently found that this excess filled the whole region out to about 10 degrees from the galactic center. Now, there have been some subsequent studies that find that you can also approximately describe this excess by if just the central part is pretty symmetric and the outer regions look more like the um, stellar bulge of the Milky Way, which is more like a box or a peanut shape than something that's really spherically symmetric. So within the uncertainties on the diffuse background, um, I don't think that you can firmly say that it's definitely spherically symmetric, but it does not look like the disk of the Milky Way. It looks much more extended than that. Much more extended than this happened. So, um, now this is, so, what I've just told you is fairly uncontroversial. This is the controversy. What could it be? So, obviously, the hypothesis that is every particle theorist's favorite hypothesis is maybe this could be dark matter particles colliding and making photons. <coughs> uh, so this would make particle theorists happy. But there is also the possibility that what we're looking at is what particle theorists call conventional astrophysics. Um, i.e. any astrophysics that doesn't actually involve adding new particles to the standard model. So, um, so within that framework, what are our options? Well, one thing that you might say is, okay, well, everything you've told me so far about how to make uh, gamma rays, you talked about how you could make it from charged <coughs> particles interacting with the gas and starlight, maybe that's going on here. We know that there's some kind of outflow from the galactic center that's forming the Fermi bubbles, maybe that's also forming this excess. Uh, I'm not going to give a lot of weight to that argument at the moment, just because um, the morphology of the excess makes it somewhat hard to describe in that way, and I'm happy to say more if people have questions. The astrophysical explanation that's gotten a lot more attention is the possibility that what we're looking at is not a diffuse signal, but some population of gamma-ray emitting stars. 
or other point sources. And in particular, the most discussed candidate is pulsars, and in particular, millisecond pulsars. That's, again, a simple reason for why that is true. So this is, again, a plot of the spectrum of the excess from a different analysis. This is statistical errors only in the black error bars. The black line is a fit based on a particular dark matter model. I think this is um, you know, a 40 GeV dark matter particle annihilating the B quarks. One of the points in favor of the dark matter hypothesis is that if you ask what cross-section is needed to match this signal, it comes out as 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, which you might remember is the correct annihilation rate to give you the right abundance of dark matter in our universe. So like that would be very nice. There are nice dark matter models that can explain this signal, but the reason people like the pulsar hypothesis is that these other dashed lines on this plot are the observed spectra of <coughs> pulsars and ensembles of pulsars in Fermi data. And you see that those spectra look quite a lot like the data. The, um, the exception is that at low energies, the data um, undershoot these observed spectra from pulsars. But as I said, these black points have statistical errors only, no systematic uncertainties, and the systematic uncertainties get large at low energies. So. Okay, so that was the uh, status quo on the galactic center excess as of about um, five years ago. Everything else I'm going to tell you is about the debate as to whether <coughs> which of these hypotheses, if any, are correct. So I guess I'm just going to pause again at this point and ask if anyone wants to ask any clarifying questions before I get into the nitty gritty of this. So uh, the shape of the thing, yeah, does it prefer annihilation versus decays? Or? Uh, it, it's, it's much easier to describe with annihilation rather than decay. So the difference between annihilation and decay is that annihilation being a two-body process would go like the density of the halo squared, and decay would just go like one power of the halo density. If you model this as spherically symmetric, the amount of flux as a function of volume, and you, you assume it's very closely symmetric and you're looking at it in projection, then it's consistent with the um, flux as a function of volume scaling as r to the minus 2.5, where r is the distance from the galactic center. So if you want to do this with decay, you would need the dark matter density rising as r to the minus 2.5, which is very steep compared to expectations from simulations. If you want to do it with annihilation, you can do it with like r to the minus 1.25 with an error bar that extends between about r to the minus 1 and r to the minus 1.4. Um, and that's a lot closer to what you would expect from simulations. Now, some people will say, I have strong confidence that baryonic processes are going to flatten out the dark matter density in, the se in, the, in a milky way so that it doesn't go like out of the minus 1 or out of the minus 1.2, it goes like out of the 0. And if you have a very high confidence of that, then the signal is not dark matter annihilation. But uh, for, mo I mean, for me, and I think for most people in the field, we feel that the slope of the dark matter density profile in the innermost part of the Milky Way is just pretty uncertain and hard to predict. And so we could be consistent with a slope like this, but it would be very hard to make it work with decay. Okay, people, people happy with this? Anyone need more? Okay, we're good. All right, yeah, okay. Uh, you told us the dark matter does not interact at all with light in any way. How um, come it annihilates into photons? But so what is the interaction? So we don't know, of course, that it doesn't interact with light at all. We just know that it interacts with light at most pretty weakly. So, but, but that said, yeah, the, the expected interaction here, if this actually was dark matter, would be that the dark matter is annihilating into um, particles such as quarks, standard model quarks of some species. These could be B quarks, they could be lighter quarks. And then as those quarks hadronize, they will form pions, neutral and charged pions. They can also form protons and antiprotons and heavier things, but because the pions are the lightest mesons, they tend to form a lot of, any hadronization process will tend to form quite a few of them. And then neutral pions decay to photons with a 99% branching ratio. So the dark matter is not directly annihilating to the photons, but it would be annihilating to visible particles, which can subsequently decay producing photons. But yeah, for this signal to happen, there does have to be some non-zero interaction between dark and visible matter. And it's possible there is no such interaction, in which case this is definitely not a dark matter signal. But our upper limits on this interaction are, like, are, are, are sufficient to allow for this kind of behavior. Although, as, as uh, Neil knows and can tell you, if this is dark matter, it puts um, very stringent constraints on how dark matter can interact with the standard model that we have seen a signal here and we have not seen a signal in other places. Like, it sort of narrows you down to a particular set of models. 
but if dark matter can annihilate into quarks and yeah. anti-quarks, doesn't it mean that it, it would also interact with non-particles? With, with yeah, protons yeah. or neutrons? Yeah, it would. So, um, yeah, so as I said, we don't know for sure that, like, we, we hope that there is some such interaction. There's a very large experimental program based on looking for those interactions. They haven't yet seen a signal, but that doesn't mean the interaction isn't there, it just puts an upper limit. So, yeah, like, if this was dark matter, it would be our first detection of such an interaction. Okay, so now let me tell, now let me get into the, um, the Okay, so, okay, well, let me say one more thing first, which is, what's a pulsar? Um, so a pulsar is a rapidly rotating neutron star that emits a beam of radiation as it spins. It can emit in radio or X-ray or gamma ray wavelengths. If what we're looking at, so we, the, the signal, because it covers 5,000 light years, would clearly not just be one pulsar. If this signal is coming from pulsars, it would be coming from hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of pulsars in which we are seeing a few photons in each case. Millisecond pulsars have gotten particular attention in the context of the galactic center excess. They have very short millisecond periods. They lose energy slowly over long lifetimes. It's thought that the way you get millisecond pulsars, if you have an old pulsar that's um, spun down, and then it gets spun back up by accretion from a partner star. So for this region, you expect millisecond pulsars to appear in binary systems. And so with millisecond pulsars, it may be easy to explain why you would get a large uh, population in very dense regions, uh, in very dense stellar regions around the galactic center. Um, that said, none of the claimed evidence for pulsars as part of the excess has ever um, like found individual pulsars in the excess and timed them. So um, you know, when I talk about pulsars, it could be millisecond pulsars, it could be other kinds of pulsars. I will mostly just mean point sources that have the right gamma ray spectrum. Okay, so my, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you now about the pulsar wars. And episode one in the pulsar wars, in which I was involved, was when my collaborators and I, in 2015, uh, came up with an um, adaptation of a method that had been developed for gamma rays by uh, David Hogg uh, and Dmitry Meleshev. And we wanted to use a, we wanted to try to work out a statistical approach to distinguishing these hypotheses. So, the approach that we took, uh, and you know, just to spoil you, I'm going to tell you this cool new statistical method, and then I'm going to tell you that you should be aware of systematic errors and the results are not as clear cut as they seem, so don't get too deeply attached to this method. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> but I want to first tell you about method. So this was developed, uh, so this idea was developed by um, Samuel Lee, Marangelo Lisanti, and Ben Safti in 2015, and then applied to real gamma ray data in a paper with me and uh, Wei Shui. So the idea here is basically, if what we want to tell the difference is between dark matter or diffuse emission from cosmic rays interacting with the gas and starlight on one hand, and a bunch of pulsars on the other hand, then maybe we can use the granularity of the excess as a distinguishing mechanism. So in the dark matter origin hypothesis, we expect that the signal traces the dark matter density squared, and uh, we expect the dark matter density to be pretty smooth towards the galactic center, with not a lot of like, very dense clumps of dark matter because they get disrupted by the galactic disk. If the dark matter is a subatomic particle, every single line of sight to the galactic center excess is going to have dark matter particles along it. So we expect the signal to look kind of like this, fairly smooth, sub with Poisson fluctuations on the brightness. On the other hand, if the excess originates from a collection of point sources, then we might then, not every line of sight to the galactic near the galactic center, need to have a pulsar along it. So we can have, we might hope to see a collection of hot spots with cold spots in between them. So what we would like to do is design a statistical analysis to tell the difference between the clumpiness of the photons in these two cases. Uh, there was a related analysis by Bartels et al. in 2016, which used a different approach using wavelets to try to find evidence for just how much small scale power there was in the inner galaxy. And Sam McDermott's talk tomorrow will focus on that approach and more recent work. So uh, you should go to his talk if you want to learn more about that. I'm going to focus on the first one. So what we did was uh, just said, OK, we can exploit the fact that the photon statistics, the probability of getting a certain number of photons per pixel, is different between smooth emission and a population of point sources. So let me just give you let me just give you a toy example. So suppose I tell you on one hand that I expect that my model predicts 10 photons per pixel in some region of the sky, and I ask you to tell me what's my probability that I get zero photons or 12 photons or 100 photons. 
Now, with no other information, the first thing you might say is, okay, uh, let's assume the events are independent, we'll use the Poisson distribution. And then I would say my probability of getting 12 photons is about 0.1, my probability of getting 0 photons is about 5 times 10 to the minus 5, and my probability of getting 100 photons is extremely tiny. If I see 100 photons, it probably means my model is wrong if I don't have 10 to the 63 pixels. But now, so okay, so we're comfortable with this. But suppose now I say, actually, there was information I did not give you. Um, what you're looking at is not actually, um, I, we, while it's true that I expect 10 photons per pixel, what I'm actually envisaging is that there's some population of sources in this area. And what I meant was that these sources each produce 100 photons per source, but there's only, but the expected number of sources per pixel is only 0.1. So here I still expect a mean number of photons per pixel of 10, but now if I ask you what's the probability of getting zero photons, I don't get a few times 10 to the minus 5, I get 90%. If I ask the same number for the probability of getting 12 photons, previously that was pretty common, but now I get 10 to the minus 29 because first I need to have a source in this pixel and then I need its number of photons to fluctuate down from 100 to 12, which is pretty unlikely. Uh, my probability of getting 100 photons is now quite reasonable. It's just my probability of getting a source times my probability of getting exactly the expected number of photons. I'm dropping terms from multiple sources per pixel here. This is, this is just an illustration. So if these are my two hypotheses, then, and I have some collection of photons, of, of some modest collection of pixels to look at, then if I see any one pixel with 100 photons, then the second, it basically has to be the second hypothesis because it's so unlikely under the first. If I see pixels with uh, 12 photons, on the other hand, the chances are very good that I'm looking at the first hypothesis, not the second. So by looking at the distribution of photon numbers, not just their means, I can potentially distinguish between diffuse emission and a population of resources. Now we can extend, now there's nothing here that says I can only do this when all the pixels have the same expected number of photons. I can work out the probability of seeing a certain number of pixels given some model where that model can, may or may not include populations of sources. So what you can do is do a template fitting <coughs> analysis, which means that we're going to model the sky within some energy range just as a linear combination of spatial templates or maps. And then in, so our model is going to be parameterized by the coefficients of each of these templates and maybe other degrees of freedom that the templates have. So um, in this case, so the analyses that have been done before of the excess using purely um, templates assuming purely smooth and diffuse emission. You might put in a model for the diffuse emission from cosmic rays interacting with the gas in starlight. One such model is at the top of that page on the right. You could put in a model for the Fermi bubbles, since we believe that, since we know that they're there. You could put in a model for isotropic emission coming from uh, gamma rays in other galaxies that um, is fairly uniform all over the sky. And we could put in a model for our signal, which is labeled NFW for the dark matter density profile that we're using, but it's just a blob that has been established to be a reasonably good fit to the galactic center access within this region. Now, if you get any of these templates wrong, you can have uh, unfortunate consequences, and I will talk a bit more about that later. But let's, for the moment, uh, assume that these are, this is a pretty good description of our data. So we could build a model from this where the co where the um, parameters of our model are the coefficients of each of these templates. We're modeling the sky as a linear combination of these. But now we can also include templates that correspond to populations of point sources. We could include point sources in other galaxies distributed roughly or isotropically over the sky, point sources associated with the disk of the galaxy where most of the stars are, and potentially a point source signal template for a population of point sources, that's gen a hypothetical population of point sources that's generating the galactic center excess. Now for these templates, we're going to have, um, each one is going to have a coefficient, so that's going to be another parameter of our model. And then for each of these templates, we also have three degrees of freedom associated with um, how, what the probability is of getting a source of a certain brightness. You could parameterize that in more than one way, we just parameterize it as a broken power law, which has three parameters. Okay, so now we have this model for the sky, which is a linear combination of these various components. Um, which has 4, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 degrees of freedom. So then as a function of, uh, of the parameters of the model, we can work out the probability of getting the observed data given this model. And so the only difference between, for example, this template and this template is how it contributes to the probability of getting a certain number of photons giving the model, given the model is different because the statistics are different between point source populations and smooth emission. 
Uh, and then we can, once we've evaluated the probability of the data given this model, we can try varying all those input parameters, we can maximize the likelihood, we can use it to derive posterior probability distributions on the parameters, uh, and so on. So this is a likelihood analysis, but with some extra, with some non-Poissonian likelihoods included in the calculation. Okay, so what, we, so what do we find when we do that is that, um, so this is the analysis that we did in 2015. This um, inner, so this inner region is the inset, is the fit that we did before we included the possibility of point sources tracing the galactic center excess. This is a posterior probability distribution. It's showing the probability that a certain fraction of the flux within some region is associated with the galactic center excess. In the region used for normalization here, the expectation is about seven or eight percent should be the galactic center excess. The red line is our dark matter template, our smooth galactic center excess template. And you see that we, as, as expected, it's picking up about 7% of the total flux in this region. But then the larger panel shows what happens if you um, throw into the fit the possibility of a template for a population of point sources tracing the galactic center excess. The red line still corresponds to the smooth galactic center excess, and you see now it's peaked at 0% of the flux. The yellow line corresponds to the point sources making up the galactic center excess, and you see they're now peaked at 7 or 8% of the flux. So the conclusion of this analysis in 2015 was, okay, the FIT strongly prefers that 100% of the excess is coming from a point source population. So that's the uh, sad for people who wanted this to be dark matter, people who are like, we have just discovered a brand new point source popul a brand new pulsar population that no one knew about in the inner galaxy, we're very pleased. But, there's a but. So, and, and this was large, consequently, largely the consensus in that, like, if you'd asked me two years ago what the answer was, I would have told you that the excess is made of pulsars. But there's a but. So, <laughs> episode two. So this, um, this work is uh, done in a paper with, uh, led by Rebecca Lean, who's a postdoc at MIT, which we published in PRL uh, last year. So you might worry, having done this analysis, what are my systematic uncertainties? Like, what kind of systematics do I need to worry about? In any template-based analysis, there's a possibility that if you get the templates wrong, you can get very misleading answers. Like, if that template that I was putting in for the diffuse emission from the galaxy was wrong in some way, maybe that can spill over into what I've learned about the properties of the excess. Um, so one general way to test for problems is just to say, let's take the real data, let's simulate a signal and add it to the real data, and then let's run the pipeline again and see if I can get back out the simulated signal that I put in. Okay, so in particular, we were gonna test, let's simulate a dark matter signal, add it to the real data, and then run this fit that I just described on the result. And what we would like to see is that the fit says, ah, you have a dark matter signal here, and also the point source signal that it previously found. So we first did this test on data where we, which, on just mock data, not on the real data. So we, where we had simulated uh, the data based on the best fit description of the real data. And so each of these plots is again a posterior probability distribution plot. The flux fraction, now purple here, is the, GC, is the galactic center excess point sources template, and uh, red is the dark matter. So the fit before we inject any extra dark matter, in, we're now using a different region of interest, and the um, excess is about 2.5% of the total flux, and we see that before we inject anything, that's all getting attributed to point sources as you would expect. Then we inject a dark matter component uh, with amplitude corresponding to this blue line, and when we run the fit, we see that, so it's not getting it quite right. The red is the posterior for the dark matter. We'd like it to overlap with the blue line, and it does, but like, it's about one and a half sigma off. Um, so it's, it's sort of getting it, but it's not great. But as we continue to inject more dark matter, um, so we increase the blue injected dark matter line, we run the analysis again, we find that the fit starts to get it correctly, it says, yep, you have a dark matter signal in this data set, you also have the point sources in the data set that were there from the beginning. And as we keep increasing the amount of dark matter, the reconstructed amount of dark matter also goes up. Okay, so this is in simulations. This is what we expect to happen if we understand what's going on in the data. But uh, this is what happens in the real data. So in the real data, before we inject anything, um, the excess is reconstructed as 100% point sources. We inject dark matter corresponding to the blue line, and the red posterior for the dark matter you see is still pretty inconsistent, is very, is really quite inconsistent with what we injected, much more so than it was in the simulations. But in this level, at the simulations, 
you know, even in the simulations, the reconstruction wasn't great, so we can keep going. But in this case, we can inject an injected signal that's about three times larger than the excess itself, where in the simulations, we would expect this now to be reconstructed very well. And what has happened? The fit is still saying that there is no dark matter in the simulation. It's attributing a hundred, all of the dark matter that we injected to this point source population. So this tells you that something is going wrong in the data compared to the simulations. It tells you that there is likely a discrepancy between our model of the real data and the actual real data, and that that discrepancy is large enough to potentially hide an order one smooth contribution to the galactic center excess. If you can't find an injected dark matter signal that's three times larger than the excess, can you trust that you would find a dark matter signal if it was the excess? So our tentative answer was no. You can, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can look at this in a slightly different way as well. You can say, okay, let's, um, it's very non-physical for a dark matter signal to be negative, but let's see what happens if we run this fit allowing the dark matter signal to go negative just to see if it wants to go into a non-physical region. This is what happens in a simulation when we do this. So red is the posterior for the dark matter. And you know, maybe it runs a little negative, but it's still very consistent with zero. But in the real data, what happens is this. Um, the dark, the truth, uh, so the galactic center excess is about two and a half percent of the total here. What happens once we allow the smooth component to go negative is that the best fit is actually the smooth component wants to be about um, minus four times the galactic center excess and the point source component wants to be plus five times the galactic center excess. So again, um, you know, it sort of looked like we were getting something sensible with this pipeline, but actually the fit really wants to push into a, um, into a quite non-physical region. So that's a little alarming. So these two analyses both show some discrepancy between results for the real data and the mock data, and it appears large enough to hide a signal that's larger than the galactic center excess itself. So that suggests that we have some problem in our background or signal templates, um, something that doesn't describe the real data, and that that could potentially have pretty important effects on our results. So this doesn't mean it's not point sources. It definitely doesn't mean that it's actually dark matter, but it means that we would like to understand this effect if we want to really use this pipeline to distinguish scenarios. Okay, so now we come to the end of the stuff that's actually been published, and you are the first uh, group to hear about this in a formal talk. I want to tell you in my last five minutes um, just about some preliminary work that Rebecca and I have been doing, which will hopefully be published fairly <coughs> soon, um, which digs a bit deeper into this. So a question we could ask is, okay, you're su I'm suspicious, based on this injection test, that there's something going wrong in the real data. Something that could potential, but something, there's a big bit of a difference between something could be going wrong and I understand what's going on. So can we find an example of a, of a type of systematic effect that would generate a strong preference for point sources, an apparent strong preference for point sources, where actually there aren't any point sources in the data? And if so, can I find an example of such an effect that appears to actually be happening in the real data? And the answer, so everything from this point forward is preliminary, okay? So, you know, take with grain of salt has not been reviewed, uh, but I'll show you what we've got. Our preliminary answer is yes. So. We have done a new analysis. We've zoomed into a somewhat smaller region of interest. We've used more photon data. But this is what we find. What we find is that when you, so I told you earlier that we were assuming that the galactic center excess was symmetric. It was, um, you know, it was the same in the north and in the south. And that was based on previous analyses of the galactic center excess, which found that to be true. But that depends on a certain choice of background model, which was not the same background model used in earlier points analyses of whether the galactic center excess was point sources or smooth emission. And when you actually go back and ask, does the excess still want to be symmetric with this background model, you find that it does not. In fact, the galactic center excess has a pretty strong preference to be brighter in the north of the gamma ray sky than in the south of the gamma ray sky. So if you, okay, so, so first we understand this, like our templates have missed this asymmetry. We're effectively assuming that our templates have to be the same in the north and in the south for the excess, and that's not actually what the data prefers. So we can remedy this. We can break our templates into a northern component and a southern component and let them float separately. <coughs> and we do the analysis of point sources versus dark matter, where both the point sources and the dark matter are allowed to have different brightnesses in the north versus the south. When we do this, the preference for point sources goes away, essentially completely. So previously, 
We had a preference of point sources with a Bayes factor of 10 to the 15, for those of you who do Bayesian analyses. As soon as we break them in half, the Bayes factor goes down to 7. Um, so, to me, when I first saw this, this was quite surprising, because I would have naively expected the, the results for a symmetric galactic center excess templates are kind of like an average of the results in the north and the south. But this says if you treat the north and the south separately, there are no point sources. But if you tie them together, there's a very strong preference for point sources. So um, we, can, we can dig into... So, um, so this is... So, okay, so this first part at the top is just showing with smooth templates only, what is the preference for the amount of uh, GC in the north versus in the south? You see it's different by about a factor of two. This lower plot here is showing when we just fit with a single G GC template as before, what happens to the excess. Again, the numbers on the x-axis are different because we're fitting in a different region. We see here that the point sources come back at about 15%. The dark matter comes back at zero. Um, but when we split them into north and south components, the green and the orange lines here are the posteriors for point sources, and the red and the blue lines are posteriors for the smooth components. So the behavior completely reverses. We split things up it's happy for the whole excess to just be smooth, so long as it's asymmetric. Um, so, in real data, what appears to be true is that we assume this north-south symmetry, we get a strong preference for point sources, it goes away completely when a smooth asymmetric signal is allowed. So we can test this in simulations. We can simulate a case where, in addition to all our backgrounds, we have a smooth asymmetric signal, and then ask, suppose we fitted it with our previous assumption that the GC had to be north-south symmetric, would that fake? a preference of point sources, in this case where we understand everything about the backgrounds, and we find that it does. So um, this is the, so this top panel is real data, where we've fitted the real data with our, our previous analysis, just a single template for the smooth emission and for the point sources, and as previously it comes back as 100% point sources. The lower panel is a simulation where there are no point sources in the galactic center excess. We've just simulated a smooth excess with more power in the north and in the south. But when you run the same analysis, you again find that the excess comes back at 100% point sources with no dark matter. You can ask, what is the relative brightness of the sources in the real data and in this mocked up simulated analysis where there are no point sources in the excess? The blue line is telling you about what the inferred number of sources uh, per unit as a function of their flux is in the data. And the bottom panel is showing the same results for the simulation. And you see, but all I want you to take away from this is that they look very similar. So we can reproduce, so even though in the real data, it looked like we have this strong preference for point sources, it has a strong preference for the excess being 100% point sources, we can reproduce these properties in detail um, in a simulation where there are no point sources in the galactic center excess, so long as the excess is allowed to have some north-south asymmetry. So what's the physics going on here? It's really sort of what is the math? What is the statistic? So if I had a really strong assumption that the excess must be north-south symmetric, like the truth must be whatever mechanism is generating the excess, it must be the same in the north and in the south, then it's completely correct that if the excess wants to be asymmetric, it's easier to do that with a point source population than with a smooth signal. Uh, it's and it's just because the source population has a higher variance, because the number of sources is, um, oops, sorry, that's equality sign is the wrong way around. The number of sources is smaller than the number of photons. So if I asked, you know, what is, so just let me give you a very toy example. Suppose I had 2,000 photons in the north and 1,000 photons in the south, and I want to explain this with a physical mechanism that is the same in the north and in the south. Now if I say this is just some smooth mechanism, I've got to use Poisson statistics, the best I can do is say there are about 1,500 photons expected in the north and the south, and I had a 10 sigma upward fluctuation in one and a 10 sigma downward fluctuation in the other. Like, that's the best I can do. But if I'm allowed to use the point source population, this is super easy to explain. I just say, um, well, I have sources which give you about a thousand photons each, and there are two sources in the north and one source in the south. And so it's much easier to explain an asymmetry because of if, if you have a point source population. So if we're sure the galactic center excess is truly symmetric, then the fit is correct to prefer point sources. But since I at least am not at all sure the galactic center excess is truly symmetric, it's a simpler explanation and a much better fit to the data to just say that the galactic center excess to be, appears to be somewhat asymmetric. And once that possibility is taken into account, then at least in the analysis that we have done, there no longer appears to be a strong preference for point sources. So, um, the summary of that preliminary result, <coughs> and I'm about to wrap up because I know it's time, 
The summary of the preliminary result is just that for the analysis that we've done, once you allow for north-south asymmetry in the galactic center excess, there isn't any more preference for point sources. Uh, we confirm in simulation, we can reproduce this behavior in simulations. It, you do expect that if the truth is an asymmetric smooth galactic center excess, and you do the analyses that we've done, then you'd find this strong preference for point sources, even though they aren't really there. Um, so my takeaway from this at this point, that there's not really evidence that is both that is robust, that the galactic center excess contains <coughs> a physical point source population. Okay, so the um, so the, the, la the last thing I want to say, I'm going to skip this because Sam's going to talk about it tomorrow and I'm out of time, but you can also just go try to look for those point sources directly. Uh, Sam McDermott and his collaborators did an analysis of this type at the end of last year, and broadly what they found was that there was also in that search not much evidence for bright point sources contributing significantly, contributing a large amount to the galactic center excess. So what I take away from their paper is that at least the bulk of the emission in the excess should be diffuse originating from faint sources. So this may be open the door to a possible dark matter interpretation. Now, if you want to really kill the dark matter interpretation comprehensively, <laughs> the, uh, the best way to win the pulsar wars on that front might be to look for the pulsars in a different frequency band. If you could see the pulsars showing up in radio or x-ray detections and you found a whole bunch of pulsars in this region with the right morphology, then I think that would convince you that it's definitely pulsars. But the evidence that that will definitely happen from the gamma rays is, I think, weaker now that we understand these systematics. Okay, so to wrap up, the galactic center excess, the puzzle that I've been telling you about, seems to be a pretty robust feature of the central region of the Milky Way. The leading explanations are some kind of millisecond pulsar population or maybe an exotic signal from annihilating dark matter. Um, if we model the GC as a linear combination of a population of point source and a smooth diffuse component, then previous analyses have found that there was a pretty strong preference for the bulk of the GC to be entirely attributed to the point sources. But in more recent work, we have done a couple of tests that throw doubt on this. We tested the effect of injecting an additional smooth dark matter signal into the real data, and we found that even with pretty large injected dark matter signals, the pipeline did, um, attributed it to point sources. So that's a bit suspicion inducing. Um, and in preliminary work, we found an explicit mechanism by which the fit can attribute smooth emission to point sources. We've shown that the apparent preference for point sources, at least for the region of background models that we tested, seem to basically come solely from a preference that the signal should be not south asymmetric. And it's a better description of the data to just describe it as a smooth asymmetric signal. So that emphasizes that you know, if we really want to figure out what the excess is, which I would like to know, we need to, we either, you know, need input from other frequency bands or we need to understand our signal and background models better to reliably characterize point source populations with these methods. At the moment, the excess currently seems pretty consistent with being dominantly smooth and diffuse. So maybe it could be a dark matter signal after all, but there's a lot more work done to be done to be able to establish that. So thanks very much for listening. Do you have any intuition as to whether the smooth asymmetry would be more likely due to some physical effect or a systematic error in one of the background maps? My strong guess is that it's more likely. I'm biased towards thinking it's a system systematic error in one of the background maps, just because. So that diffuse background model, which we know like, is not great, um, is a lot brighter in the north than in the south. And it's you know it's an order of magnitude bright like the excess is a is an order of ten percent effect. So like if I get the diffuse model wrong by five percent, and the diffuse model is much brighter than in the north than in the south, then it wouldn't be that hard to induce a, like fake asymmetry in the GCE. So you know if I had to guess, I would guess that that's more likely what's going on. That's partly because I have both the pulsar and the dark matter interpretation seem like they would be easier to it would be easier to get something roughly symmetric than something very asymmetric so i have a bit of theory bias there but so i guess that it's this but um but i but i don't know of course sure yeah i guess i had the same question but how to rephrase it could, could you allow uh your smooth background to to be an uncertainty in the analysis yeah as well? yeah so yes so um yeah, good. Right. So I'm 
I mean, if we like we do we float the overall normalization of the diffuse background in all of these analyses, um, but that is very likely not enough for you. Like, we, well, we know for sure this is not enough freedom to get a good fit to the data. Like, nominally, every single fit that I have shown is a, is a like, formally bad fit to the data. And this is true, like, just across the whole Fermi sky, because you may be able to explain everything down to the percent level, but when you have a few hundred million photons in your data set, then percent level is a lot bigger than Poisson noise. Um, so, yeah, so, like, in... So in principle, it makes a lot of sense to like add extra degrees of freedom to account for uncertainties in the diffuse emission model. The question is always just sort of, well, what degrees of freedom do you add? So like there's a group in Amsterdam that has this SkyFats diffuse emission model where they add an extra degree of freedom for every pixel in the sky, <coughs> um, which does allow you to get a good fit to the data, but, but you worry, like, I mean, you would need to validate that pretty heavily with simulations in this case to understand, like, what goes on, like, if I have an error in some other template, how easily can it get uh, absorbed into all those extra degrees of freedom, right? Like, I mean, it would just take a lot of validation. Um, there's, I know that my colleagues, uh, Ben Safty and Nick Rod, uh, have been, well, they, they said they would send me a draft of their paper uh, yesterday or today, so hopefully it will land in my inbox soon. But uh, they've been working on giving the diffuse model extra freedom in a somewhat more measure, with a smaller number of extra degrees of freedom, basically like doing spherical harmonic modulations of the diffuse model. And that I think is, yeah, so like I'm definitely not, I think it's entirely possible that you can build a better version of the MPTF pipeline that avoids some of these issues. But I think now that I understand that just like a smooth asymmetry can be interpreted as really strong evidence for point sources, it's like those future studies, it's gonna be important to make a case that you're dealing with this problem, and that you're unlikely to be biased in this way. But but that may very well be possible. So yeah, well, I, I was going to ask sort of a variant of the same thing, but I mean certainly like an L to the extent that it's a template fit and yeah. LHC stuff is doing lots of template fits. Like we, we would very rarely do a fit where we just scale the normalization yeah. of all the pieces. We would have uncertainties on the shapes of everything, and and then we have various types of things to try to do like goodness of fit checks and things like that. So so you already kind of talked about systematics on the shapes and of course that's you know it's a modeling choice of how you do it and it yeah. requires effort and stuff. But but in terms of like goodness of fit, is there is, is there some are there checks now that are kind of like a uh, Yeah, I I mean right. So you can I, I mean it is so Right, so, so like when I say base factor in favor of stuff, I'm always comparing relative likelihood yeah, ratios, right. I'm comparing two hypotheses. Um, so, and, and like the absolute, I mean, absolute goodness of fit, like we can look at it, but right. it's always bad. So, I, yeah, so I mean, so you can say, um, right, so I mean, you can say, of course, like let's, like let's put, a, let's put a whole bunch of extra systematic uncertainties in and dial them up until the goodness of fit looks, looks like a good number. But again, like the question of exactly how you do that seems like that there's not sort of an, there's not like an obvious simple an obvious single prescription with which gets that right. But no, I mean, yeah, I I definitely be. I mean, I I think you know we've we've chatted a couple of times in the past. I've chatted to a couple of LHC people in the past about um how because I mean a lot of this is about how do you really parameterize the uncertainties, okay. and unfortunately a lot of that is sort of a question of well how well do we think we know how cosmic rays propagate around the center of the galaxy? Sure. And a lot of that information is sort it's of at the level of, it, it, it's sort of <laughs> at the level where, you know, we think we know roughly what's going on at high confidence, but in detail, we don't know what's going, like we don't really know what's going sure. on. And so, so like, I, yeah, like I would, I would really like to have a better parameterization of the uncertainties in all these templates. And I think like in principle, that's probably the right way to do it. But. Like, I feel like you can make an error that's in the direction of you just sort of throw up your hands and say, we don't know anything. And that's probably like yeah, I mean, I equally as middle. useless an yeah, error. Right, yeah. that's right. Like, so I think the correct space to be is somewhere in the middle and I don't know how to find exactly the right location in the middle. Because I mean, because you can certainly make, I mean, you can certainly say, oh, we just don't know anything about the background model. And then the answer is conclusively, then it's impossible to tell the answer. But I, I feel like, I mean, we do actually know quite a bit about yeah, the background and we should be able to use nice, that information. Uh, sort of non-parametric things that sit in the middle where you can put some, yeah. don't, don't let it, it's not totally arbitrary, uh, you know, anything can do anything. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, am, I am definitely very interested in thinking about methods that we can do better background modeling, and I'm hopeful that these kind of systematic tests that we've been doing can sort of like serve as a validation, like, like a, as we come up with better ways to model the backgrounds, let's check if we make this particular kind of error, which we know can cause problems, then 
is your method capable of dealing with that error and you know parameterize and you know accounting for it or either like either getting around it or saying like hmm there's a problem here we have identified that there's a problem we should look at it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely don't want the takeaway from this to be it's completely impossible to do anything in gamma ray. It's just that uh, if you do things, uh, that, that things like adding one degree of freedom to one of the smooth templates can completely change the preference for point sources, and so you just have to be careful. About this kind of thing. Any questions? Okay, well, if there are any, uh, we will have a reception. Maybe you can catch Tracy for a moment before she runs back to Boston. So let's uh, thank her, thank her again. I don't know how long you're going to be here for your life, but it might be zero.